in my books, Keepers of the Garden and the Custodians. I've done t- over 25 years' work with ETs and UFOs, and I've not found any negativity whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful, positive beings. What I've discovered in those, they're the ones that created the human beings on Earth. Mm-hmm. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the world. And I've had clients who went back there at those times when the world was being created, when the earth was volcanic eruptions and lava and all the ammonia in the air. They went back to those times to where their job was to help clean the air out and to stabilize the earth because you had to do that before you could have any life here. Then after all that was calmed down, they had to create the water. These are just ordinary people that relive these lifetimes. So you can see, if you had had a life where you helped create a planet, if you helped create water, give life to a planet, you don't think you can create your life now? Wow. You are a co-creator with God. You always have been. You have great powers. You're just on a nevertheless in this time. Many holy scriptures tell us that God has granted humankind the grand privilege of being co-creators of the earth with Him. As God's blessed children, we are endowed with God-like qualities and possess the ability to carry forth Here's work. Therefore, we are stewards in Here's Garden of Eden, caretakers of Here's house, and the custodians of Here's land. With these powers in our hands, we have the ability to heal our planet. So they were there when the water was created. First you had to have plants before you could have life. So they're the ones that created the life. They brought single-celled organisms to the planet. Now, people say, where is God in all of this? He's very much there because God is the one who told them where to go. Mm -hmm. And many of them, this is their job, to go all over the universe, finding planets that have developed to the point they can have life. Earth got to that point that it could cool down enough that we could have life. They have histories of all the planets in the councils. There's councils over everything. And so when a planet reaches that point, it is given its life charter. Then it's decided by these other beings, and this is what they do, and they live enormously long lifetimes because there is no time anyway. And so they're told to go to the planet and start, and they bring single-celled organisms to the planet just to see if they can get something started. And it depends on the primeval soup of the planet, the chemicals in the air, the soil, what is going to develop. They never know. The single-celled organisms begin to clump together to make multi-celled organisms and develop life of some kind. You would be surprised what you could have looked like. (laughs) It all depends on the development. Where do these cells come from? They collect them from everywhere, and they just see what is going to grow and combine together. And it will begin to develop into plants, into animals, life of some sort. You can imagine how long this would have taken. So I've had people go back to lifetimes when they were the cedars, trying to spread life to get it going. But if you can get something going, then they come back over eons of time and groom it to get it to go. Like plants have to be there before you have animals. A lot of the animals were brought from other planets just to see what would grow here and what would evolve here. So they said, Give this beautiful planet a being with intelligence and free will and see what he does with it. This is one of the most difficult, challenging planets to live on. So to come here, you have to be a master manifester, even be allowed to step foot on this planet. Because it's so hard, the lessons are so hard. And then when you come, of course, all the memories erased, you forget the rules, you forget why you're here. As the animals began to develop, they picked the monkey to manipulate the genes in order to create people because 
it had a big brain capacity and it also had hands. You've got to have hands if you're going to uh, create tools. You know, we are about 98% compatible genetically with the ape. So we are so closely related. So they picked that one and they began to manipulate it to create a being that would turn into an intelligent being. In the American television science fiction series, Star Trek, the protagonist, the captain of a spaceship that visits different planets, was bound by the prime directive set by a United Nations type organization called the United Federation of Planets. The prime directive states that he is not to interfere in the development of civilizations. Ms. Cannon says that the prime directive is an actual law of our universe. Now there was one other rule that was definite in this. It's the Star Trek directive of non-interference. Mm -hmm. It's real, it's not fiction. Because they said you cannot interfere with the development of a civilization once it's begun. You give them free will and then you have to just see what they're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, okay, you're coming and you're giving them the next advancement when they need it as they go along. It could be anything. Once they get one part, then they bring another advancement when the timeline is right. So I said, isn't that interference if you come and tell them what they should do? They said, no, that is a gift we give them one time, what they should be doing next. And what they do with it is free will. It's up to them. And most of the time when they take it, they use it in the wrong way, mostly turning it into a weapon or something that is negative. And I said, can't you just come back and tell them they're doing it wrong? That no, that's interference. The only time they are ever allowed to interfere is if we were to get to the point we were going to blow up the world. Right. They said that one little planet if it were to destroy itself, it would have reverberations throughout the solar system, throughout the galaxies. It could cause untold damage, even spreading into other dimensions where there were other civilizations. So if we ever got to the point we were going to blow up the world, they would have to step in and stop it. Given the prime directive, it would appear the universe is unable to aid humanity except under the most dire of circumstances. However, Dolores Cannon says there is another way that the universe still helps shape our planet's destiny. They said we can't interfere from the outside, but maybe we can influence from the inside. The people on Earth can't do it. They're caught on the wheel of karma, going round and round. We need pure souls who have never been on earth before, who have never been caught up in the wheel of karma. So the call went out for the volunteers. Who wants to come and help earth? Earth is in trouble. These are pure souls who have not been contaminated by earth. They, one of the rules is when you come in, you forget. We're the only planet where we forget our contracts, we forget our association with God, and we have to stumble back and discover it all over again. It's a very challenging planet. They have volunteered to come to Earth to help Earth. But of course, when you get here, you have no memory, it's erased, and they think, what in the world am I doing here? They don't understand these people. I found three waves of volunteers. Some people will go back to planets where they've in other lives, where other dimensions, never been on Earth before. Other ones go back to God or what they call the Source and have never ever left the Source, never been in a body at all. Now the third wave are the children. And many of them now are in their early teens. They're the hope of the world. They are coming in with all of the DNA has already been changed. They are here to do their purpose. Of course, they don't know it consciously. <laughs>